Good morning or afternoon. It's 12.36 p.m. on Sunday, July 23rd, 2017. I'm Christiana Ellis, and I slept in this morning. This is five more minutes, and today is Sunday, so that means it is time for continuing the rewatch of Avatar, The Last Airbender, this time with Season 3, Episode 8, The Puppet Master. This is actually one of my favorite episodes, and I would say certainly my favorite episode of uh, the series that doesn't uh, involve the sort of main plot. Uh, it's another one of the sort of filler episodes where it's, you know, character building and world building um, without necessarily advancing the plot of trying to defeat the Fire Lord. Uh, so, but at the same time, this one, I think part of what makes it stand out is that it's such a unique, um, type of conflict, uh, and that, uh, it's really also one that, that in a very real way, the kids don't really win. They don't really come out on top. The, uh, the old lady gets what she wanted for the most part, and, um... And uh, Katara is left feeling kind of deceived and tainted by the whole experience, which is kind of dark. Um, now, obviously, I don't, you know, we don't want to overplay that. But just to be sure, that's a different sort of uh, uh, story to tell here. And it's also, you know, we've, we've certainly spent time with Fire Nation citizens that are not evil. Um, but you know, as a reminder that, that we also need to know that like, well, or, you know, even the Southern Water Tribe, you know, uh, they're not all good people either. But at the same time, Hama in this uh, episode, like she's doing some evil things for sure. But what is her, you know, she, she had some evil things done to her that sort of drove her to it. And so it's, there's, and also the whole thing is just super creepy. Um, the idea of bloodbending in the first place and also kind of the ghost story mystery aspect of the investigation before they kind of discover the truth. Uh, there's some great stuff in this episode. It's just really well executed. It's paced well. And just the presentation of everything I think is great. So obviously we have the kids starting off, uh, they're telling ghost stories around a campfire. Um, and oddly enough, this is one uh, example where Katara ends up telling the best story by far. I only say oddly enough just because, uh, you know, lots of times they kind of play at the idea that she is not necessarily as naturally charismatic with performative type things like that. Um, uh, and sometimes when, you know, that's l like the times where it's like, what? I can be funny. I can be funny. She puts Momo on her head. It's like, see, you know, that sort of thing. But uh, she definitely has the best ghost story uh, telling, you know, the story of, you know, the, the little uh, girl in the water tribe who got lost in the snow and seeing the ghostly image of, oh, I can't get warm, can't get warm, and uh, tells it well, and it's definitely creepiest, and I don't know, it's, it, you know, from a writing perspective, I wonder if they gave her the best story just because they're kind of setting up that it's a Katara-focused episode. Um, could be. But in any event, uh, everyone uh, definitely feels that the uh, story is kind of creepy. But uh, then Toph claims to be able to hear people screaming from under the mountain. And they all kind of assume, uh, well, you know, she must be imagining things. And, you know, it's a reasonable assumption. Um, but uh, they don't investigate. And, uh, you know, we wonder, too, if they might have, if not for... Uh, encountering Hama in the woods, who uh, is this old woman who appears helpless and friendly and uh, encourages them to come s stay at her inn nearby. And it's an interesting thing to ask that is never really presented as a question in the episode, but just like, what was Hama doing out in the woods? Right? So that's something that feeds into the 
the answer later. And, uh, you know, it's obviously, we could imagine an innocent ex explanation, like she sees the campfire from her inn or something like that. Uh, but we also certainly learn later that she had been listening to them talk around their campfire for longer than uh, she revealed before she, you know, uh, announced herself. In any event, uh, she seems nice, and they are eager to... Uh, you know, take up her, take up her offer for a place to stay. Uh, they have some tea, and uh, and she warns them. You know, oh, you got to be careful in these woods. People are disappearing. Um, which is also, you know, given that it's her. You know, doing it. Uh, we we can't help but wonder. Like, that's a little bit of writing convenience, I think. You know, like, why would she bother? doing that if she's the one disappearing people and therefore would know who is in danger and who's not. Unless, of course, she's just kind of being playful about the whole thing. Um, uh, which sounds like some, that sounds like something she might do. But uh, in the, in the meantime, though, uh, they, they, uh, you know, Sokka is in the one that still seems like he's the most wound up about, uh, still being spooked for the ghost stories and he feels like the now the inn is creepy but then he falls asleep immediately anyway um but uh so that you know in the next morning they're sort of feeling better and more comfortable and uh you know hama has proven herself a, a good hostess and uh so they're like you know what let's you know we can we can stay around here for a little bit longer um, and while they're shopping in the morning, uh, they keep hearing more and more of the stories about the people missing, right? And so they're concluding now, this is not just a rumor, this is probably something real happening. And the and uh, Aang's conclusion, um, which again seems reasonable based on their past experience, is that this sounds like a spirit world thing. You know, people going missing during the full moon. Yeah, that sounds like a spirit world thing. One thing that I wonder if they could have established better is, you know, in any of these myths or folk tales about full moon things, not just in the show, but in real life, it's always vaguely ill-defined when you say full moon is like, is that one night worth? Is that three nights? It's kind of, you know, <laughs> whatever is needed, right? Usually it's uh, not just one night per month because that makes it harder to tell these stories. But it also just kind of raises the question, though, of, you know, people have been going missing on full moons, but, you know, like, how long has this been going on, right? Because if, you know, the number of people we saw locked up in that cave, if it was only one person a month, that's, you know, that seems like some of them must have been there for a long time. Uh, but in any case, though, uh, the idea that uh, Toph and Sokka and Aang are going to start looking around and trying to figure out, okay, well, what might have been done in this town recently that would make the spirits mad? Um, and then we get a moment of uh, uh, that leads to a good quote where Hama sends, sends the, uh, the kids back to the inn uh, ahead of her so that she can attend some mystery errands and uh, Sokka's like oh that's your town is really mysterious and she grins and just says mysterious town for mysterious children and that's kind of creepy and ominous and mysterious and it's a fun quote that definitely leaves uh, Sokka feeling very suspicious and um, uh, but it's also I think you know I think the more obvious first conclusion for the kids might have been just that, oh, she knows more about us than she has let on in the sense that she's calling us mysterious, but it's also acknowledging her own mysteriousness, which like, what's, what's that all about? Um, <clears throat> and so of course they go snooping. Sokka in particular is going snooping and, um, and Toph is, uh, you know, right at his side for that but then Katara is doing that thing where <clears throat> um I'm going to disapprove of this as I follow you around and look at whatever you look at 
so like you know she gets the moral superiority of being um the disapproving one and yet not actually stopping him and also benefiting from anything he discovers <laughs> um and then ang is kind of not sure so he's sort of going along too um but in any event they find creepy wooden puppets um which, other than the sort of metaphorical connection to bloodbending, we don't really ever get any payoff on why she has those, other than she just likes them, because the, of the metaphorical connection, perhaps. Uh, but then they, uh, they find the, the special little box. Um, we get a neat use of Toph's earthbending um, meteor bracelet uh, to make a key. And I like too, though, that it's not um, it, it's it's not super easy, right? Like it it's more than just like oh yeah, I can just make it a key shape and it automatically works. She actually has to, you know, fiddle it around in the lock and make adjustments, and it takes a little while to do. And uh, I like uh, I like that that builds tension that it's taking too long, and that in fact Hama returns before they get it open. But then we get a reveal. Oh, her secret errands. She was buying Water Tribe food ingredients so that she could cook a Water Tribe meal. And the box has a, a whale tooth comb. And uh, like, oh, water bending. You know, that's great. Um, water Tribe stuff. And so it's kind of a relief of tension. The idea that we have an answer to what was so mysterious and now there's an even deeper bond especially for katara because once they discover it hama's a waterbender too it's like oh, i didn't i never knew any other waterbenders from my tribe and isn't that great um it just occurred to me that it you know given the setup of the little water tribe girl that goes missing in katara's ghost story i think i wonder if there was a version of this where Hama was intended to be that girl, but I'm kind of glad that they didn't do that. It's kind of would be a little bit like with the Southern, um, you know, when they go to the Northern Water Tribe and there's the water master that happens to be, you know, grand grand's ex boyfriend sort of thing. Like, you know, you don't need to make all of those connections. It can, can actually shrink the world a little bit, but having just the, that she's from, Another waterbender from the Southern Water Tribe is, I think, a sufficient connection. Um, and so she, they, you know, they're obviously curious of like, uh, so what are you doing here? Being a secret water, water tribe person living in the Fire Nation. Um, also, that you're secretly a waterbender, it just seem, seems dangerous. You know, wouldn't there be better places to be? But uh, um, she apparently was... Uh, uh, captured uh, during raids uh, of her of their tribe and and the fire nation apparently specifically sought out waterbenders and kidnapped them and that's why there are so few left at the southern tribe it is because uh, the fire nation literally kidnapped them all and imprisoned them and put them in uh, these prisons that would prevent them from waterbending which we we don't get all of that right away but only that um, um, out of everyone that was imprisoned that uh, Hama says she was the only one to escape alive and we don't really get into the details of that yet. But so the next day we have uh, the, re you know, Toph and Sokka and Aang continuing to try to investigate and finding this is weird because there doesn't really seem to be anything that would be angering the spirits right now. So what could be causing this? Maybe there's something else going on. And in the meantime, we have Katara learning more about uh, waterbending from Hama and things are starting to ratchet up with the tension and the creepiness factor of Hama just very slowly. The pacing of this build of tension is really great. Just a little tick. Tick, these little you know, water droplets of of tension being added to things where things kind of just don't seem quite right or aspects of what she's doing are a little bit sinister and it just builds so cool. So she's saying, I'm going to train you in all these great techniques, which is great, right? But 
you know, then her, you know, one of her immediate go-to things is drawing water right out of the air and using it to make essentially claws on her hand, which she then sticks into a tree. And it's just kind of this, you know, it's sort of a creepy image and she's a little bit too delighted with herself. Um, uh, kind of a creepy smile. And then she shows, oh, look at these beautiful fire lily flowers. And you can pull water from them too. And she does, and it kills this whole circle of, uh, of flowers and it's and so Katara's instinct is like oh but you killed the flowers like oh who cares they're just flowers and so the all of what she's saying it sounds reasonable in a sense of like okay well yeah the claws maybe are a little creepy but yeah okay I mean those could be if you're fighting you need something and being able to pull water out of the air makes sense that's that you would want to be able to do that and and uh, she has a point that you know if you're fighting for survival you have to be able to get water from wherever you can even if it kills these flowers um, and so again she keeps having explanations that well yeah I guess so but we we feel this you know slight tightening the, the turning of the screw uh, with each one of these little examples and so uh, immediate, you know, we finally get the, you know, the connection of these two plot threads with um, Aang, Toph, and Sokka finding out, oh, well, we found the one guy who seems to have survived whatever is taking people, and he claims that he never saw a spirit, but instead what he felt like was that he was possessed and it tried to make him walk into a cave in the mountain. And then Toph makes the connection Oh, when I thought I heard people screaming under the mountain, that must have been real. So they actually go and they find um, they find this cave, and that there is captured in, uh, prison, villagers imprisoned there, uh, and they draw connections and from the uh, you know witness testimony of these prisoners that they're freeing. It's Hama doing it, and so that's where we finally are getting to uh um you know the this this ultimate waterbending technique can only be done in the full moon when waterbenders powers are at their greatest um i should add just as a brief moment so i don't uh forget uh just how delightful it was when uh at one point toff i think says something about moon power being creepy and uh and Sokka is very quick to say, no, no, the uh, the moon spirit is a gentle, loving lady who rules the sky with compassion and lunar goodness. And it's just, you know, a reminder that he's a little sensitive about the moon because of Princess Yui from season one. Um, but in any case, uh, this, uh, this technique turns out you can b bend the water in people's blood and basically control their bodies against their will. And she talks about how that being how she managed to escape by practicing on rats in this prison where they weren't, you know, the only time they were ever allowed access to water or they're bound. But by practicing on rats and then bending the blood of a prison guard, she was able to make him let her out. Uh, and then she escaped. And it's interesting, too, because in the depiction of the escape, we certainly don't see her make any attempt to free any other prisoners. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's possible that she was the only one left, but they don't make that clear. And so it's tied in, of course, to this idea that maybe she's really actually not such a nice person after all, you know, maybe driven to it, but driven to extremes, but still. And in any event, uh, Katara is immediately, uh, kind of repulsed by the idea of, of bloodbending and, uh, you know, uh, and Hama ha reveals now that her ultimate goal here is actually not so much caring about whether these Fire Nation prisoners get uh, rescued or not, but rather just this idea that she's old now and she has developed the ultimate blood uh, water bending technique as far as she can. She's concerned, and she wants to pass on that technique so that Katara can continue her work. And so the idea that uh, um, she's going to force Katara to learn it is uh, scary, right? 
And so there, we get a lot of, uh, you know, fighting of, um, uh, you know, Katara using her waterbending against an, another waterbending master and a lot of stuff there. And then it gets complicated when uh, Aang and Sokka show up and get bloodbended and Katara is forced just by necessity, just like Hama predicted, when you're fighting for survival or to defend your friends, you need to be able to use whatever techniques are available to you. And so she ends up doing both the thing where she pulls water out of the plants around her and she basically disintegrates a couple of trees by pulling the water out of them and, and pulling it out of the grass. And then finally stops Hama from uh, making Sokka and Aang hurt each other by Katara bloodbending Hama. But it's, again, it's a little bit like that whole, it's a little bit Star Wars in the sense of, <laughs> you know, you're, you know, good, good, yes, let your anger take control, that sort of thing. And so by, by using the technique on Hama, Katara has implicitly accepted that sometimes you might need to do such a thing, which is what she had initially tried to reject. And so even though, you know, the villagers are rescued and she get you know, Hama gets led away in, in, in chains and presumably is going to be, have to be imprisoned again, uh, in a little in the same kind of prison, because how else would you keep her there? Um, but the idea though, that she feels, well, I got what I wanted, which is that I taught, I taught a young waterbender how to bloodbend. And Katara now is left feeling like she's kind of been violated. She was deceived and betrayed her trust in another waterbender from the Southern tribe. And so even though now she knows this new ultimate um, technique that feels dark and evil, and she ended up feeling like she was forced to use it and... And so is in tears at the end of the episode. And so it's a it's a powerful, memorable episode. Um, it's definitely one of the ones that I remembered uh, the most. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think that that uh, that's that's probably all I've got for this episode. Uh, so I will be back next week with more Avatar: The Last Airbender, and I'll talk to you all tomorrow for five more minutes.